The DFS-228 was one of Nazi Germany's most ambitious reconnaissance projects. A rocket-powered, high-altitude research aircraft designed to fly so high that it approached the boundary of space. While most nations were still struggling to break 10 to 12 kilometers, Germany was already developing aircraft that targeted over 23,000 meters. If completed and mass-produced, it could have operated beyond the reach of Allied defenses. Built as a strategic spy plane, the DFS-228 aimed to photograph Allied installations from near-space altitudes while flying too fast and too high to intercept. Its missions would rely on rapid rocket acceleration, gliding return, and a pressure cabin capable of keeping the pilot alive in the stratosphere. The Allies had no comparable project during the war, making the aircraft decades ahead of aviation norms. The DFS-228 project began in 1940 at the Deutsche Forschungsanstalt für Siegelflug, a research institution specializing in aerodynamic experimentation. Germany needed new reconnaissance methods after Allied air defenses improved rapidly. Traditional aircraft suffered greater losses as radar and fighter coverage expanded. Engineers realized that altitude was the best defensive armor. A revolutionary concept was born. Early drafts outlined a rocket-powered aircraft that would launch vertically or from a towplane. Once it reached extreme altitude, it would level out and conduct reconnaissance missions from near space. After flying at the edge of the atmosphere, the aircraft would glide back home like a space shuttle. No other military project in the world followed this operational idea. It was pure aerospace experimentation. The DFS research team included some of the most advanced aerodynamic thinkers of the era. Engineers had already developed world-class gliders, making Germany a leader in unpowered flight science. This knowledge transferred directly into the DFS-228 sleek, lightweight aerodynamic frame. Every element was optimized for thin air operation. It looked more like a spacecraft than a fighter. The design demanded a radically different approach to pilot survival. At 20 kilometers altitude, Air pressure is so low that an unprotected pilot would lose consciousness in seconds. Conventional cockpits were useless. A fully pressurized cabin was introduced, complete with life support systems. It was one of the first of its kind in military aviation. Engineers predicted that the DFS-228 could reach an operational altitude that would place it fully beyond Allied interceptor capability. At such heights, enemy fighters could not climb fast enough to engage. Anti-aircraft weapons were also ineffective. The aircraft would essentially operate in a safe corridor in the upper atmosphere. Reconnaissance missions could be conducted with minimal risk. From the beginning, the Luftwaffe understood that such a machine would change aerial intelligence forever. Satellite reconnaissance was still science fiction at the time. The DFS-228 promised a similar effect using 1940s technology. Photo imagery from 20-plus kilometers would reveal entire regions with extreme clarity. This was intelligence warfare pushed into the future. Though the concept impressed planners, the project received only modest early resources. Germany's war priorities focused on conventional aircraft and frontline fighters. The DFS-228 remained an experimental program rather than a mass-funded national initiative. Progressed slowly despite its groundbreaking potential. But development never stopped. The DFS-228 used the Walter HWK-509 rocket engine, the same basic propulsion family that powered the Mi-163 Comet. This engine produced enormous thrust for rapid vertical ascent. It burned volatile propellants that demanded precise handling. Fuel consumption was extremely high. The aircraft relied on speed rather than endurance. During test flights, the aircraft could accelerate rapidly into the upper atmosphere within minutes. Traditional piston fighters could not match this. Within moments, the reconnaissance craft was above conventional aviation altitudes. The performance shocked engineers worldwide after the war. 
The future of aerospace was glimpsed in 1941. The aircraft was designed to operate partly without fuel. After reaching altitude, engines would shut down and the DFS-228 would function as a high-performance glider. Thin air meant minimal drag, enabling exceptionally long glide distances. This mission profile reduced fuel needs significantly. It also made detection harder. The sleek fuselage and thin wings were engineered to withstand aerodynamic stress hostile to most aircraft. At 23,000 meters, conventional wings lose much of their lift. The DFS 228's form compensated using precision shaping and weight reduction. Every component was purpose built, no excess mass was allowed. The pressurized cabin was among the most advanced ever fielded in wartime. It featured reinforced glass, emergency oxygen, and thermal protection. At near vacuum altitudes, temperatures drop below minus 60 degrees Celsius. Without the cabin, the pilot could not survive even seconds. Life support was nearly space grade by World War II standards. Engine cooling and airflow control required new engineering solutions. Air was too thin to remove heat effectively at high altitude. Therefore, liquid metal cooling and enhanced internal circulation were introduced. These solutions were decades ahead of common use. Many were studied by Allied engineers after the war. The DFS-228 became a milestone in early aerospace propulsion. It was not only fast, it operated where traditional aerodynamics broke down. Much of the data gathered later fed into post-war jet, rocket, and research aircraft. Though the program remained small, its scientific contribution was enormous. Flying to the edge of space meant creating survival technology unheard of in 1940. Pressure suits were still experimental and unreliable. The DFS solution was a fully pressurized cabin with sealed doors and oxygen recycling. The pilot could function normally at 23,000 meters. This was revolutionary for wartime aviation. A unique emergency ejection system was developed. If the aircraft broke apart or depressurized, the pilot could detach the entire nose cabin. This cabin fell independently and deployed parachutes automatically. Once stable, the pilot could exit manually. No other frontline aircraft used such a system at the time. Thermal protection was another major challenge. The cabin needed insulation not only from cold but also from friction heat during descent. Engineers developed a layered shell that balanced both conditions. The solution was innovative and difficult to manufacture. Yet tests showed reliable performance. Life support systems needed to last long enough for high-altitude glide missions. Oxygen tanks, regulators, and CO2 scrubbing had to remain stable for extended flight duration. Engineers calculated usage rates precisely. The pilot's safety depended entirely on redundancy. Mechanical failures at altitude meant instant fatality. Instrument panels were redesigned for thin air operation. Standard gauges failed at extreme altitude due to pressure imbalance. Sensitive altimeters and flight indicators were developed specifically for stratospheric flight. These would later influence instruments in experimental aircraft worldwide. It represented a scientific leap forward. Pilot training also needed reevaluation. Conventional flight experience did not prepare aviators for the near space environment. DFS test pilots trained using hypobaric chambers, high G tests, and simulation. They needed to understand oxygen starvation symptoms, frostbite risks, and emergency recovery procedures. This created a new type of specialist pilot. The safety systems of the DFS 228 became as historically significant as the aircraft itself. They marked a transition from wartime aviation toward true aerospace flight. Allied captured reports later emphasized that Germany had independently invented many early spaceflight survival concepts. The world would adopt them in the decades that followed. 
the first test flights focused on evaluating stability and aerodynamic behavior. Engineers measured lift, drag, control responsiveness, and gliding efficiency at varying altitudes. Results were encouraging even before rocket power was fully integrated. The aircraft demonstrated smooth handling. Confidence in the concept increased. As rocket testing progressed, the DFS-228 began reaching extreme altitudes. Some flights were believed to exceed 20 kilometers. No Allied aircraft had reached comparable performance. Even the fastest jets could not approach it. Engineers realized they were flying into the future. Photography tests demonstrated that the DFS-228 could map large areas from a single mission. High-resolution optics provided strategic intelligence unmatched at the time. Entire military installations could be photographed without entering enemy airspace. The aircraft was more than fast, it was strategically valuable. Reconnaissance without risk became possible. Landing tests refined the gliding return profile. The aircraft descended from the stratosphere like a spacecraft, maintaining high glide ratios. Pilots practiced energy management carefully. A miscalculation could leave the aircraft short of the runway. Precision flying was mandatory. Engine reliability became a continuing concern. Rocket technology of the era was powerful but unstable. Fuel mixture variations could cause power loss or catastrophic failure. Maintenance crews needed specialized knowledge. The aircraft was ahead of its time and ahead of service infrastructure. Even with challenges, test data showed that the DFS-228 could outperform every interceptor in service. It proved that altitude supremacy was the ultimate defensive weapon. The higher you flew, the safer you were. This strategic understanding would shape Cold War aviation philosophy. Despite limited prototype construction, test flights confirmed that the concept was functional, not theoretical. Engineers successfully demonstrated near-space operation using 1940s materials and science. It was clear that the DFS-228 had broken aviation boundaries. The only missing ingredient was wartime production capacity. The DFS-228 never reached mass deployment, not because of failure, but because Germany was collapsing by the time prototypes were ready. Factories were bombed, fuel was scarce, and strategic focus shifted to survival. High-technology programs received fewer resources. The aircraft was simply too late for the war. Only a small number of prototypes were completed, and flight testing remained limited. Luftwaffe planners never received enough aircraft to begin operational reconnaissance missions. The program stayed experimental until the end. Yet every flight delivered engineering breakthroughs. The data would live on. When Allied forces captured remaining prototypes and documents, they immediately realized the importance of the DFS project. Intelligence reports described it as a glimpse into aviation's future. Nothing comparable existed in the United States, Britain, or the USSR. The scientific advantage stunned investigators. American and Soviet engineers analyzed the aircraft extensively after the war. Pressure cabin concepts, rocket propulsion approaches, and extreme altitude aerodynamics provided valuable insights. These concepts later influenced Cold War spy aircraft development. The DFS-228 indirectly shaped designs such as the U-2 and high-altitude experimental jets. Many historians believe that if the DFS-228 had been developed earlier, it could have altered reconnaissance across multiple fronts. High-altitude intelligence might have given Germany a significant planning advantage. Battles could have unfolded differently. Pure technology wasn't the limitation time was. As an aerospace experiment, the DFS-228 became a milestone analogous to early space research. It transitioned aircraft from atmospheric flight toward spaceflight principles. It forced engineers to think about the environment above the sky. This mindset would later define the space age.
Today, the DFS-228 is remembered not as a failed project, but as a project ahead of history. It bridged the gap between aircraft and spacecraft decades before anyone else reached that point. Its legacy remains visible in the entire evolution of high-altitude surveillance and early space engineering. The aircraft touched the edge of space long before humanity was ready.